And thank you um, for joining us this afternoon. We're here today with Susanna Marin. And um, I was really excited to find out that Susanna actually this is her alter ego. <laughs> um, so Susanna Marin is her pen name, but um, Susanna is also known, best known for her other, she writes a lot of nonfiction under her real name, Susan Shapiro. Um, Barish, right? Or yeah, so, um, well, well, I don't want, I don't want to talk about your other work. I mean, we're here today to talk about the Palm Beach series. And so my first question is, since this, the, the Palm Beach scandal, this is the second book in the series, and I still have to go back and read the first one. Does, does, the, is the series going to follow the same family or does it move around for different families in Palm Beach? It moves around to different families in Palm Beach. So the books are sister books, shall we say, mm -hmm. and they stand alone, but you'll sometimes see some characters that overlap. Okay, so what, what, why did you pick Palm Beach? Did you live there before? Or you just have you visited? Because you're from New York, right? <laughs> I grew, actually, I grew up on the Jersey Shore, and my mother was from Brooklyn, and my father was a ranked amateur tennis player for many decades in Florida. And so they got to Palm Beach and were really able to kind of go through different circles because of his abilities in tennis. And so my mother, who lived in Brooklyn before it was cool, um, saw Palm Beach and had never really seen anything like it. And she was intrigued. And my brother, my older brother and I ended up being there since we were little children. Oh, okay, that's you know, cool. Every vacation, every school vacation. And then the day I left for college, my parents became residents. Oh, that's, that's actually really fun. So, so it was just, so it is some place that you've been, so you're very familiar with the area and then you were able to write about it. And actually I chose it on purpose because in my real life as a gender professor at Marymount Manhattan College, and as the author of the nonfiction books, um, where I look at, I do studies and I interview a diverse group of women across the country, all different ages, ethnicity, race, religion, um, social strata, level of education, you know, from rural areas, cities, suburbs, small towns, looking at how women feel about the emotional issues in their life. So I've written a book on I've written three different studies on the role of wife in America. Mm -hmm. I've written a book on why women keep secrets and lie for the cause, female infidelity, um, why marriage is so important to us, uh, sisters, mothers and daughters, mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law. And so Palm Beach, which is a place, as we know, that's very privileged and supposedly exudes perfection because it's so physically beautiful. For those who don't know, it's a barrier island. It's only mm -hmm. 18 miles long or so, maybe two miles wide and tons of real beauty. The intracoastal on one side, the ocean on the other. And so I would walk along Worth Avenue, which is like the Rodeo Dive of Palm Beach. And I, with my mother or my friends, and I would say, what lurks beneath? because women have so much long grits. And so I decided to take women and look at how they really feel and what they're really navigating to survive. So I, I do want to apologize to our viewers. We, we are having a, a few technical difficulties on my side this time. <laughs> so uh, it does bump out a little bit, but I, we can still hear Susanna. <laughs> so we still, we're still able to hear her, but every once in a while. No, no, no. It, it's every time my computer will freeze you. So you're, you're, we can hear you, but we don't, we don't see your mouth moving. So I, I want to apologize to, to our attendees because we are having a couple of technical difficulties. But we'll hopefully get through it without having to restart. But um, so the the book was I really like the book because it I mean you're you're tackling a very sensitive topic and it's a topic that a lot of I think women have dealt with and I have colleagues and friends who who have gone through the same sort of um, you know they waited to start a family and then when they are ready to start the family it doesn't go according to plan and um, and the, you know this. The title is the Palm Beach Scandal, and I really was expecting that that the whole the um, the two Elodie and 
Aubrey's, just their having, you know, she, when you read it, it's, it's um, it was Elodie, right? I think I'm getting mixed up, but Elodie. Elodie right, so it's two sisters mm -hmm. and they're eight years apart. And Elodie is the older perfect child, if we believe in family systems, which I do. And there was a lot of pressure on Elodie to be the perfect daughter or the good girl and the pleaser. I'm very interested in what being a pleaser does for females in our culture. So she's really done everything right. She married the it boy. She went to an Ivy League college. She has a degree in library science. She runs the programming and is trying to make it more interesting and diverse at the Palm Beach Literary Society, which is a fictive place. And her sister, Aubrey, who's only 32 to Elodie's 40, is not married. She's a music rep in the music world and she's very hip and she has no interest in getting married or having children. Whereas Elodie feels that the one piece of her life that is not complete is that she doesn't have a child and she's unable to have a child. And I'm looking at female rivalry because I did a whole study on that called Tripping the Prom Queen. Um, does, does Elodie feel that the societal message is that she must have a child to have a whole life and plus the pressure from her husband because I told you I like to look at you know how marriage mm -hmm. plays out for women what being a wife is really about and is does it come from outside in so that it, it's nurture the culture telling us you need to have a child and be a mother or is it a you know baby crave a longing and has she waited too late so that's really Elodie's plight yeah and it's the um and you see that too because like as the story evolves you start to see that um her mother and her father also were under that same pressure that they had as the the I guess to the true scandal really unfolds that it's still a family scandal but it still very much was um and, and I think to the parents dilemma is much different, but sort of the same. It's that they want to have a child. They have to have that family to be the perfect model family is to have children. And what, what you know, level of appearances, how great is it to appear a certain way? What level of happiness comes from an outer appearance? Now, obviously having children, and I have three, um, is not, you know, just something that's for show. I mean, it's a really profound experience and it's complicated and challenging and ongoing. So the idea that this family is so invested in how they appear has a lot to do with where they live. So it's mm -hmm. like a circular conversation because in Palm Beach, everyone has to appear perfect. But in fact, this, this is a reflection of how women feel in so many different places, that somehow they're being judged and measured. And that's really dangerous for women, because like I said, we've been raised to please and to do the right thing. The other aspect of it is that these sisters are so opposite. And I don't want to give the book away, but I can just tell you that we're off to the races once Elodie reluctantly asks Aubrey at the beginning of the novel to be the carrier, to, to, mm -hmm. to, to actually to be the surrogate for this baby. And, you know, they, they kind of gloss over how this will be a game changer in ways they can't even anticipate. But the truth is you can't have that ask of someone and not change everything as you've known it. So well, this is a story about what's uncovered, a deep family secret, and also about who you are as a female when you're put to the test. What is your integrity? Who are you really? You no, know, and that really, it does change the whole dynamic and it changes the way um, that Aubrey feels too. I mean, you really see that change over time with her and, and, and Tyler. Um, but it also, the, the very hint of something that's, at the very beginning when the father sort of is like, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, you, you, that's what I think it was. The, um, it's sort of the callous, like, like what's going on? And then uh, it's, the, the book really was like an onion. You're peeling back layers and you're finding out these, these things. And it's like I said, the, at first I'm thinking the scandal is, I mean, because the mom's really worried about their appearance. 
that you've asked the sister to carry your baby and what are people going to think and what are they going to say and the mom's very very concerned about the show how everybody around them in Palm Beach is going to reflect and I think any small community any small town wealthy or not has the same sort of like reluctance what are people going to think you know especially since Aubrey is not married um, not married yet she's you know living this you know, rock and roll sort of lifestyle with Tyler, that it really is just this really um, dynamic. And, but yeah, one stepfather, and I don't want to give, give you that. I mean, that scandal, I think, was like part of the like, wow, like, like really. But it, there's also these layers to it, too, because it's uh, like we said, a family that a parents that really wanted to have a family. And then what do you do? And the, you really talk about also how the times have really changed about how people perceive um, surrogacy and how people had to do it back in the day when they wanted a kid. Um, and I, uh, well, Yes, I mean, you're making really good points. Um, I'm also looking at the dynamic in each relationship. Mm -hmm. So Elodie, she's so confused. And of course there's a, you know, we don't want to give away the book, but there's a great, price for the clarity for each woman in this book. And having written a nonfiction book on mothers-in-law, daughters-in-law, I give James, Elodie's husband, quite the mother. So, e so even this mother-in-law is altered, but because she craves, and so does Veronica, their mother, Elodie mm -hmm. and Aubrey's mother, this baby craving that almost over how much pressure and so I wanted to look at that but for Jane for, I mean for Simon the father mm -hmm. and for Veronica I'm looking at what it's like to be a couple with grown children and still feel so invested and so involved with them while Veronica really would like to have a couple-centric marriage where she's finally not working at you know mothers in children, the charity. And she really has a chance to kind of be a glamorous woman over 65 in Palm Beach. And by the way, another reason I chose Palm Beach is that remarkably ageism isn't quite, for women isn't quite as harsh in Palm Beach. Oh, wow. So for all the decades that my mom was there, she and her friends felt very empowered. They would walk along the avenue, Worth Avenue, or they would go to lunch, and they didn't feel invisible because they were over 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. All those years, women of any age in Palm Beach seem to feel good about themselves, and we don't see that all over the country, like mm -hmm. LA or New York, for starters. So I thought that that was interesting, and Veronica is just ready to shine with her husband, and now because of Elodie's need and Aubrey's commitment, she's drawn into really a triangle with her daughters and it gets very complex for her. Well, and it's also, it's that the whole notion too of, um, is it, cause I think even when the other scandal comes about, it's like, you really get that, the feel of the label of a parent, of, of a true parent versus a surrogate, you know, a surrogate parent, you know, the, uh, someone who gives away their child or has, um, is not truly their child. That the whole thing about labels, the ha like half sisters, siblings, especially when they start, they do the 23 and me kind of thing. We can't and, give anything away. No, and, and that, that was, well, it's part, but it's, that I really, that was something too, that's very, you know, when you're looking at all the relationships, even the relationship with Alice, it's this whole, you know, can of worms, but also how, how much does it really mean to be a parent versus, um, uh, and it's, I think that's also what Simon warns um, Elodie about too, that no matter what, this is your child. And, and I thought that was really good because it is that, that disconnect that can happen with people who aren't, they don't feel that they're fully blood related. You know what I mean? And, and I'm, yes, and I really like that you brought that up because I'm very interested in fictive family, in the people we bond with in such 
deep ways, but not, might it, you know, when someone says, oh, because I did this whole study on sisters, oh, she's like a sister to me, or I'm not as close to my sister as to the friend I choose. And, and what are these relationships based on? And why is family so, uh, the nuclear family, so emphasized in our society? But it really is. It's right up there with the, the message that you must have at least a child to be whole. So I'm looking at all these really important questions. And something else I wanted to bring up is, you know, Palm Beach is, you use the word label, is very label conscious. And so I'm looking at what materialism does to us mm -hmm. and what capitalism does to us, because there is so much uncertainty and shape-shifting in very important relationships in this novel. And yet they certainly have enough good looking clothes and wardrobe and bracelets and they certainly know where to go for lunch and dinner and they certainly earn enough money and so it, this is not where we're exposed to something but it's not really ours you know with social media everyone knows what a you know Prada bag is or you know with just the way that that you know things are disseminated news is disseminated but to know that it's not even a thought for you, it's just a given, and yet you're as unhappy as, you know, the message is that materialism will make us happy. And yet there's a scene, again, no spoiler, but there's a scene in this where a young couple is really in love, and on the eve of their wedding, they break up over a prenup. Well, prenup is for privileged people, but they lose each other because this, this is so important. So, so I'm really looking at how we're taught that finery and, and money will make us happy, but what Elodie needs is not about money, and what Aubrey does is not about money. Mm -hmm. No, and, and that's what I think is a, it's one of these strange things that you, it does, it layers the book in a certain way, where it does, it talks to everybody. It's it's not just, you know, you oh you think Palm Beach is going to be like this wealthy kid. It's sort of like watching Housewives, you know, those kind of fancy shows where everybody's super wealthy and, and you you're in this world. But you're, we've, I think we talked about this even when we chatted before that it really is. It's stuff that happens to everybody, no matter where you live, and, and people who are trying to have a child go through the same things. Um, when you know missed carriages anybody who's trying to do in vitro, um, anybody who's really wanting and struggling to have a baby, they really have all these same things happen no matter your social strata. And that was one thing that, because you sort of, like when you're just dealing with the family dynamics in the book, you forget that they have all this stuff, except when they're being at the, at the mall trying to go look at baby stuff. And they're, they're gold, gold told to do this and they're told to do that, but they're still just trying to focus on their life and their relationships together. Um, and I'm also taking a look because for all the nonfiction that I've written in, under my real name, uh, I think the most incendiary book I ever wrote is my study on why women lie. And so the lie is the behavior, but the secret is the cause. So why do we as women have big secrets and small secrets? I mean, everything from why you're late to pick up your kid to, you know, the fact that your husband is a gambler or your child has a drug problem or you yourself do and, and how we just gloss over it and the lies we tell ourselves in order to get through. So this, in, this book is called A Palm Beach Scandal. It's really built on a very, very long ago lie. Mm -hmm. And the weight of a secret and a lie is tremendous. So as long as the lie only festers and it never comes to the surface, everyone deals as best they can, the secret keepers. But once it really is opened up for everyone to see, there's so much self-doubt and there's so much that we ask about ourselves and that we have to face. It's almost like waking up. And I do believe another study that I did is about how we have called reclaiming ourselves, how women dispel a legacy of bad choices, how so many women, again, a very diverse group of women, 
um, are sleepwalking through life and only a very happy or a very unhappy event will wake us. But then we have to reevaluate our lives. And for each of these characters, this triangle of Veronica, the mother, and Elodie and Aubrey, her daughters, they each are awakened. And then we understand their character and the price of a lie. Yeah, no, and that's, like I said, it's like peeling an onion. You, you get these different layers and these different consequences from, from that one lie, but it was, it was supposed to be, and I think Alice had it, the, she said it the best way, without that one lie, none of this would have happened. You know, none of, none of the people would have been exactly. there. And, and, I, and I think that helps um, Elodie sort of step back and see the good of it, even though she, there's all this doubt all this this stuff stuff going on but i i mean i, I don't want to give away the end of the book it's a it's, but i just was like wow what, what's going to happen now and it's, i love those kind of books too because you're like you you get to use your imagination and what's going to happen what's going to happen next and you really leave us <laughs> that was why i was wondering too is is the next one going to follow the same family but you're like you said you're there standalones but within the set in the same area and occasionally they'll, they'll link. So I'm really excited about reading the first one now. So I got to go back and read that oh, one. Thank you. So, <laughs> Well, you know, it's when you talk about the ending, I've heard from a lot of readers and they've said, wow, what a surprise ending or, and you know, why did this happen? And this is my third novel. So the first book is Between the Tides. The second is Palm Beach Wife. Mm -hmm. This is the Palm Beach scandal. And um, after Between the Tides also, and this book, so for all three, I've heard from readers and they've said, wow, you know, you're known for the surprise ending. But the reason that it's interpreted, for, the reader can interpret the ending, and also that it's the surprise is because for all of my nonfiction research, I have really learned that despite our efforts as women to do everything right, there is so much unexpected in the result and that we never really know for sure, despite our best endeavor and our best intention, that everything will work out just as we plan. And so that's why the endings in my novels are the way they are. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's a great tool. It, was, <laughs> it really, like, it, for me, it really made me think, like, I wonder what, what's going to happen, what would happen next, and how do they resolve this issue? It's, and it's just, there's so much left to, to the imagination. And, and, like, I guess you're right, you could go back later on and write more, because we, there's so much more that we want to know about the, the other stuff, the search for different people. Um, so, so, um, well, so I know everybody who's watching, so you'll, you'll have to read the book. It's a really great book. And like I said, there, there are layers to it. Um, but you, you do tackle a lot of great topics in there and a lot of topics that people don't think about. And um, I know that the, the relationship with Veronica and Simon is very strained after the secrets revealed. But you know that these, they all love their children. And, and that's the, the thing is, like, it, it was that love that made, made this happen. Um, and, and got them to this point, but it's just, for them, it's, it's like I said, it's an inter internal scandal, but I guess, too, we wouldn't know what people would say if they found out, and that was one big thing they're all worried about, is somebody else um, finding out that this has happened, and that's why it's such a big secret, yeah. Yes, I, I don't think that Mimi, the mother-in-law, or Veronica, the mother, I don't think that they're any wiser or um, less encumbered expectations and people, other women chatting just because they're a certain age. And that really reflects a study I did on female friendship called Toxic Friends. Mm -hmm. that came out in about 2008, where I interviewed women of all different ages, as you know I do, and talk to them about the value of belonging to a group. And let's face it, there are plenty of groups in Palm Beach, groups of women. And women really value belonging to a certain group. And the idea of being pushed out or losing your status 
is there is kind of threatening. In some ways, women feel that these female bonds and friendships are, will outlast marriages, failed marriages, widowhood, that in the end, you know, we have our female friends. And so So it's precarious for this Cutler family. Surrogate in a town where everyone is just right. And, you know, even at the baby shower, which is one of my favorite scenes, um, it's called the Uh, is the is the husband to it because because it's you know both sisters it's a, another triangle very interested in triangles. Well, and I think that part of the the story too with the baby shower sort of puts it ahead of where <laughs> the. Um, <laughs> The triangle really is is being st strained because you know um, Aubrey really wants to open the presents <laughs> and she really wants to see what's in the presents. But the, Veronica is like, "Oh no, those are for Elodie." And they, they put them all in the car, and she really <laughs> wanted to open the presents. And it's sort of it. Yeah, you wouldn't think that they would. I I, I don't know if they would do that with the surrogate because it does sort of put that you know, whose baby really is it? And it's like, you know, does it belong to you or does it belong to the, the mother who's asked you to do this? And I think that that part of the book really put that pressure on to see like, oh my God, where is this, what's going to happen? Because that's one of the biggest fears too at the very beginning of the book um, when they talk about surrogates who have, um, don't want to relinquish the baby to the, to the mother. Like they, they will claim it as their own. That's what Veronica says to Aubrey when Aubrey's contemplating what to do for her sister. And, you know, to ask your sister this is so enormous. And so Veronica is really torn. She wants, she wants Elodie to have a baby, but she's very concerned about what does happen, which, every, which is that everything changes. And so she gives her the example of baby M and of course Aubrey's too young and has never heard of that case but I I researched that and actually many years ago in my nonfiction life I was asked by my publisher at the time to write a book on infertility and gestational carrier and surrogacy and sadly the book didn't get published but when I was working on it in the mid 90s I was so struck by the bioethics of it and the idea that we can so easily find someone to carry a baby, but the ethical aspect of it is, and that brings us back to the baby M case. So when I researched it for this novel, you know what's so fascinating? The bioethics have not, it's many years later, and yet the bioethics are not in any way really improved or honed. And so it's still the same issue because this circles back to an emotional longing. So I venture to say that when someone's a surrogate, it is transactional, but then who can predict one's emotions and then who can predict the ethical component in some ways yet still, which is really fascinating, just interesting. Well, and I think you sort of glaze on that a little bit towards when Aubrey is really, you know, towards the end, getting close to having the child. Like she really is wanting all of a sudden to become a mother. To, to she has that mother instinct that's starting to really develop. Tyler is really getting invested, even though they know it's not their child. But it's like they see the possibility of a future where they do have children together. And I, it's really nice, but. So Right, it brings them to a different place. And by the way, um, I have heard from a lot of people about Tyler, Aubrey's boyfriend, um, who's so hip and so single in the beginning, and yet has, you know, again, 
and peeling the onion, as you say, we learn who he really is. So every, and we see what they're really made of. And another aspect of it that I mentioned is that ability for all the privilege, education, great career, she feels very pressured by her husband. Mm -hmm. And really as if she, if she doesn't go along with this, she might lose him. And I think that the, the dynamic that, you know, we marry and we were young and we, we think we're on the same page and you either grow together or grow apart. And we know that we have a 50-50 chance of it working out statistically in America. So I'm also looking at what kind of marriage she has. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, and just how even her marriage is put to the test. Well, and, and that, that did happen. You know, you get that moment in the book where there is that the beginning of a strain. And, and you're right. It is. He's the one that suggests Aubrey at the very beginning where she just thinks that's appalling. And then sort of there is that pressure. And then you're, I'm like, oh, my God, is he like going to run off and leave for now? Now that this is all, you know, fruition, because there's, you know, the house that that's being, you know, built and Aubrey's having second or, uh, um, Oh. <laughs> she's having second thoughts of why are they building the house why, why, why we're doing all this stuff and then um when Aubrey's finally you know getting closer you feel that strain that's happening because he is the one that sort of pressured her to have the child even though she's not um she's not going to give birth but Aubrey's going to give birth to the child you, you're sort of worried that it's something going to happen but it doesn't it seems like it sort of settles back out and they're they're good at the end it's just you left that little moment of tension between them in the book right did you do that purposely or it was just <laughs> oh yeah I really am asking readers to think about the price of perfection and why perfection isn't the same for each of us and how so often women don't understand because they follow the script mm -hmm. and they, I mean, she's such a good example of someone who does everything right. And the, who, you, you don't really know who you are sometimes until you're truly facing an issue such as this. I also think that in Palm Beach, the, the family connections are so there. I did a lot of reset. I've been going there so it's a family place for vacations as well. Families really do come back. So there are the people who live there all year round, and then there are the snowbirds, and I mentioned that in the book. And the Cutlers live there all year round, the Cutler family, Veronica, mm -hmm. I mean, and they've raised their children there. They moved there from New York. And um, Mimi is, she is a snowbird. She comes from the Northeast and she comes just for the, during the cold winter. So there's the whole idea of season in Palm Beach. And I did a lot of research on that because I don't know if you know this, but and um, he and his wife, his last wife, who died mysteriously, that's another story, um, and who was much younger than he, they invented the season. And um, there is this idea of a very social season in Palm Beach. And so all that Veronica wants to do is have a nice season, if you will. Oh, and by the way, I even have a scene, a chapter in the novel that takes place in Henry Flagler's um, home that's now the Flagler Museum, which is quite a mansion. Well, so I've got one scene there. My last library where I used to work at was very much like Palm, Palm Beach. It, it had seasons. You had the, a whole set of people that would come in the winter 
and then they would go away in the summer and then a whole nother set of people that would come in the summer and then you had the residents that were there a lot all year round but you have these same people that would come every year like for the winter they had their their condos they would come and stay in their condos and then they would go back home in the summer and it's it, it really is any kind of resort town you have the people who live there all the time and then you, you have this a group of people that will come in for just six months and they're there for six months and they go back home and so I, I used to work in a place like that so I, I've seen that kind of of people that come in and you have friends that you know we're only going to be here during the winter and you know friends that are just going to be here during the summer um and it, that's I think it really matches with any other resort town but um the, well I, I still also want to talk to you about your your um your pin name because you wrote this there's a reason you you picked this pin name and, and we talked about it before and I, I really love that story so I want you to share that with everybody as well so so after 13 nonfiction books um let's see maybe I have a few here here's tripping the prom queen here's my book on mothers and daughters called you're grounded forever but first let's go shopping with my real name mm -hmm. um after all of these books, I decided to go back to fiction writing, and I had always loved journalism and fiction writing. And I gave my book agent, my longtime agent, the first, I guess, 75 pages of what became Between the Tides, the first novel. And when she was ready, when I completed it, and she was happy, no joke, it's very important when she or your agent's happy, and she was sending it out to the publishers, um, I said to her, you know, I'd love to have a pen name. And she said, why would you do that? You have, you know, all these nonfiction books and you've toured extensively and your work is known. And I said, well, because it differentiates the genre and because I think that for novels, the authors often have really beautiful names and because I've always had a pen name in mind, like since I was 19. And she said to me, well, let's just see. So when several publishers were interested in the novel, um, St. Martin's my longtime publisher for my nonfiction, for most of my nonfiction, um, they said, would you want a pen name? I said, I, I have it. And my agent said, no, no, they'll, they'll think of something really perfect. And I said, well, can I just tell you the name I want? And she said, okay. So I said, please tell them I want Susanna Marin. And so she called me back and she said, it's yours. And Marin is a family name. And I always wanted to be Susanna, not Susan. <laughs> so I finally, all those years later, got the name of my dreams. So have you run across a lot of people who, because who, I was really surprised when I first got, you know, I heard from your, your agent and I started doing research and I was like, wow, th there's a whole bunch of different books that are a different name. And I was like, this is, you know, wonderful. But it's it's also too, it's, I, I think you're right. It's a good way of, of you know, separating your, your nonfiction work from your fiction work. But it's also, I think, a great way for you to, to um, I guess, express the, the different types of stuff. Because you, I mean, we know you've done a lot of research. You could tell just from the book that there's a lot of research that goes into the, the topic. But um, to be able to step back and just have fun with the topic and write a fiction story, uh, well, I mean, not so much fun, but it's <laughs> fun fun for you to write, but it, it's uh, sometimes that's a great, I think that's also what makes a great book is the research that goes into a book that makes it more realistic and, and give you that real world feel to it that you get from, even from, like, you know, at first you think Palm Beach Scandal is going to be this really fluffy book, and it's not. It's a really good, um, you know, it keeps you thinking and keeps you wondering, and, and like I said, like peeling back the onion layers in the story, but the, um, for you as a writer who, who's done a lot of nonfiction writing, and you've done a, done a lot of nonfiction writing with 13 books under your belt, and now three fictions, I mean, do you, are, and I know you're still working on other stuff, right? You're working on more fiction novels and you're writing more novels. The third, the third in the trilogy of the, of the Palm Beach novels, as St. Mm -hmm. Martin's calls them. Well, I, th I think that research is so important and I love research. You know, having been a professor, a gender professor all these years, I think that research is so important and so enlightening for all of us. And I just... It's like, I can't get away from that. And I also, as I said earlier, really take the, the subject of the research and put it into the novels, which 
I hope works. It certainly gives it, like you said, another layer. Um, but, but really and truly, having a name that works with fiction was hard with the first book. Like I got to, so this, you know, now I'm on a virtual tour, but for my other books, I've been on a real tour. So with Between the Tides, I got to a library in West, Westchester County and I arrived and the head librarian who was, you know, greeting me, looked at me and said, Susan. And I said, yes. And she said, aren't you Susan Shapiro Barish? And I said, I am. And she said, well, why did I not know that? Because at first it was not disclosed in the very beginning of the tour of, um, of Between the Tides. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I certainly would have filled up the room quicker <laughs> and more easily. And that I just laughed because, so, you know, letting people know, now everyone knows, but we, I think we talked about this ahead when we mm -hmm. met. Um, you know, a lot of authors do it. A lot. I know that Nora Roberts uses J.D. Robb. We talked about that. And Joyce Carol Oates has a few pen names. I think one is Rose or Rosemary Kelly, but maybe I've got that confused. And, you know, of course, we know Mark Twain did it. But many, many authors have done it. I think Stephen King has. I could be wrong. But it's just a way to almost click your head into a different kind of writing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. It's also too that you don't want to get bogged down in what other your other writing too, because if they if they just focus on that, you want them to. That was what I was really worried about. I wanted to make sure that we we focus on the novel that you're doing a tour about, because this is what we're we're trying to get people to pick up and read. We want want that you know after they've read this, like me, they'll go back and start reading your other work, <laughs> and, and you do have a lot of other work. But I I still really like the. Um, I like the, the fiction stuff. You've done that. And now I got to go back and read, like I said, the, the rest of the series or the trilogy. Um, and then to read the other, not, not the other fiction book you have, but then to look at the, not, and I was just really surprised because when I first started looking you up to find out, you know, titles and stuff, other stuff you read, and I was like, wow, like I discovered this whole other person that's behind this person. And I think that it's really exciting for, for librarians. And I, I think you captured that in the book too, because <laughs> with, um, her doing her even her own literary stuff for the literary society it was like wow this is really what librarians do we, we love to find authors we love to talk to authors and we love to get um to showcase authors and i thought this is the funny it's sort of similar to what i'm actually doing right now is what she was doing in the book or very much like elodie's indeed mm -hmm. and i'd like to say something about libraries because uh, libraries have been so kind to me as an author and I have spoken at so many libraries over my whole career and a really great group of libraries during my virtual tour. And I think librarians are magical. And I love that we can all go to the library and get out the books that are being read and, you know, of the moment, as well as a book from 25 years ago. I mean, what a luxury. Libraries are magical. Well, and, and I like, it's, Elodie, it was really funny. It was like to read Elodie and it's like, she's doing all the stuff that we love to do. I mean, you work with kids and the longer you work in library, you do see kids grow up. And I worked in libraries long enough to see them from elementary to high schools or college. And it's just, it's a funny thing that you, and especially the longer you work in a town and a community, you really see that. And you really, Elodie's own life inside the literary society, which is very much the, even though it's a fictional place, it was very much like a library. Like here's here the library, the special collections, um, and what she did. And I just thought it was like, I don't know, it was just um, serendipity that, that, that um, your agent reached out. And I was just so excited to, to um, we're, we've like I said, we've been doing the author talks for a while for the for the year during our closures, but it was a great way to meet people. And now we're starting to get a couple like yourself, authors who are on the virtual tours across the nation. So it's really exciting. And um, I'm just glad you, you were able to do this. And um, but so you, you're working on the third book of the, the um, Palm Beach series, and, and it'll focus on a separate family, right? Do, do you think it'll be more than three, three books or? 
Well, I'm definitely going to complete, I'm actually finishing in the next week or two, I hope, <laughs> the, um, the manuscript for the third Palm Beach story. And then I'll see how I feel because I have some other ideas and I actually have a nonfiction idea too. So definitely, you know, I write all the time, <laughs> read and write and, you know, that's my life. Um, I, the new family is again, a complicated family. That's all I'll say. And again, Palm Beach is kind of a character in the novel. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that, I think that's, it's, I hadn't been there, but I just totally could relate to where the kind of traffic, you know, you get stuck in traffic, you get, and it's very, I mean, the one thing that they kept popping out was like, oh, Mar-a-Lago, and it's like, everybody's heard about that in the news, um, where I come from, but we've never been to the place, we haven't seen it, but occasionally the characters end up at Mar-a-Lago, and it's like, oh, this is a, you know, it is someplace real that people do visit and stuff, so, um, but, and that is close to Palm Beach, right? too. It's a club, that's what, so there's a scene there mm -hmm. and in a Palm Beach wife as well. And uh, my parents lived, my mother died a few years ago and my father sold their place, but they lived like maybe a mile or two from mar -a And that has its own interesting history, right? Mm -hmm. It belonged to Marjorie Merriweather Post and was a home, a private home for decades and is, looks like a castle in Europe, it's so big. And beautiful. <laughs> okay, I, I think I've run out of questions, um, Susanna. So, I mean, the, the, it's still, it's, um, I, I look forward to reading it. I don't know, I do have a, a question. So, so um, you know, how is writing about the East Coast different than writing about the West Coast? Um, have you lived on the West Coast? But or you've always been on the East Coast, Susanna. So I've... I'm really an East Coast girl. Um, as I said, I grew up on the Jersey Shore and then went to college and graduate school in New York. Um, but my youngest child lives in LA and I go to LA a lot. And I've, you know, I've just had such a great time every, every trip to California. For a Palm Beach wife, I was in San Francisco I did a local, like an ABC or CBS affiliate, I can't remember which. And um, I did some book signings and talks and LA for the for previous books and just love it. I think that there is an impression about Palm Beach that it's a very East Coast place and so, which it is. But when I was on my book tour, for a Palm Beach wife, a lot of people came up to me and said, this really feels like a town near here too, you know? So I, again, you know, these places resonate with us as you were saying about your former job, right? Yeah, no, it was it was a resort town that had um, a lot of, yeah, different people that came. And it's, yeah, I think that's what, I guess that's what Palm Beach is too, because you've talked about the, the seasons that people come down for the winter, the snowbirds, and I guess we call anybody who flees the winter a snowbird that comes to a warmer climate um, in the winter to get away from that cold. So um, that's what... But, but the sense, and I know we talked about it before, but the sense of perfection and appearing a certain way, I, I just, I chose Palm Beach very purposely because with such beauty and privilege as I mentioned before it's not a diverse community it's everyone certainly can afford to have the life mm -hmm. um but the idea that these unhappy families or a family with a secret or friendships that are on the rocks despite how much you care um or any relationship, because I'm very interested in relationships, any, like for instance, there are a lot of, um, shall we say grandmothers in South Florida and a lot of retirees. And, um, you know, the one thing that I've learned is if you're having a problem with your adult daughter or your teenage granddaughter, or you're unhappily married, or you're having an affair, it really doesn't matter or, or your 
you know, we didn't talk about this, but, or your career is in jeopardy because both Elodie and Aubrey care a lot about their careers. And I mm -hmm. really researched, you know, both. So whatever is going on in a female's life in contemporary culture, um, it, it crosses whatever, it goes across the country. You can be unhappy in Alaska or you can be troubled in New Jersey. And well, that, with these issues, it's just- and, uh, Yeah, and we talked about too, before before we got in the interview, that, that this book, like I said, really can relate to anybody in any town. It's not just because it's set in a, in a, a high-end world, that everybody who, who is struggling or has these kind, it, it you really it does run a gambit. It's like um, it, it, anybody can relate to a lot of the stuff that goes on in the book, and I think that's what I mean. Like you said, Palm Palm Beach is the character in the um, in the story, but it people who have similar things happening to them really will relate to the book, and that's what I really liked. And I, I even though we don't want to give away the bigger scandal, it's still I think people will really relate to. Um, can relate to the parents too because they're, they're from a different generation and they have different, you know, the same sort of pressure to have children, but they have different consequences to how things panned out. And I, I really love that because somebody who is, you know, Elodie's age, it was like, okay, this, this could be my life. You know, this could be the same sort of, you know, issues that faced our parents faced back, you know, when they were younger, when they were having kids. So that's what I really liked it. It does resonate. So it's not just about Palm Beach being a fancy place. It is rich. Mm -hmm. It's really that it's the characters in the book that really bring it to life and really can make people relate to it. And like, I think too, I've talked about this before. I have friends who have had the same struggle trying to have children and that that really is relatable. And the, the stress and the the sorrow that goes with having and trying to have children, you really do a great job of incorporating that into the story. It's, it's not glazed over and it's not, you know, something that's just, oh, here's this and we're going on the next thing. This is something that really helps develop, especially Elodie's character at the very beginning of the book. You really see her, her struggle and the passion that she has because she wants to have a child because her husband wants it. And you feel that pressure from him. But it's somebody who really, that I think people will really relate to. And if you have these same sort of situations or if you know somebody, you really could finally feel how they feel. And you do a great job of incorporating that into the novel. And it's like, this is where I really hope people will come back and read it. Um, and it's, and I, like I said, I'm really excited to read the first one too. I really want to see that what else is happening in this little town. And I can't wait for the third one now. So now that I know it's getting close, it'll probably be another year or so before we see it. But um, yeah, this is really exciting. And it's really exciting to talk to you, Susan. Well, and um, you. I'm really thankful that you're here and our people are, are thanking you for the talk. So um, yeah, I mean, thank you for joining us. And, um, and, and everybody watching, I, I will send out um, a link to Susanna's page and you'll actually get to see all the other books that she's written. She's a wonderful um, breadth of books to read. And um, I'm really excited about your, your nonfiction. I'm glad you're writing nonfiction. And I love that you got to finally use your pen name. <laughs> that I still think is, is somebody who, I think any writer who can relate, who always had that pen name in mind would be like you to be so happy that the publishers, yes, that's perfect. And I think it's a perfect, perfect name, but, um, cause it's very close to yours and it's something that you love. So that's, that's mm -hmm. exciting thing too, so. Well, thank you for having me. A really lovely time to get together and talk books. Yeah, and the next time you're on our side of the country, just make sure you stop by and we'd love to see you in person. So um, when the world goes back to normal and you can do real regular tours again, but we're, we're getting closer, we're getting closer. But I thank you, Susanna, Susan and Susanna, for being here. And um, like I said, it was a great reading your novel. I can't wait to read the next one. And um, yeah, I just, I'm so excited that you're still writing, writing more, more of these novels. They're gonna be fun to read, so. Thank you. Thank you again for everything. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you everybody for joining us. And um, like I said, I'll send out a follow-up email and thank you, um, Susan, for being here. And you have a great afternoon or a great evening now because you're on the East Coast. So it's getting later there. So <laughs> Bye -bye. be safe and, and, and take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.